Thank you. Thank you, Bon, for, for the very inspiring uh, presentation. And good afternoon, and thank you for all being here in this very autumn, um, um, autumn feeling uh, Friday afternoon. And um, first of all, I would like to also um, acknowledge the Hong Kong Art uh, Gallery Association for organizing uh, the third annual um, HKAGA Art Symposium, bringing together the directors and curators and also scholars, galleries here from different countries to Hong Kong to share with us their very valuable views and experience. I will also want to say a warmest uh, welcome to our uh, main, uh, main speaker and also four uh, panel uh, speakers. Um, Victoria from uh, Minneapolis and also Sarah from New York and our friend from Hong Kong, Alan and uh, Catherine. And for these sections, our discussion will be focusing on um, how a Western museum collecting and understanding contemporary art from Asia. Um, I'd like to invite, uh, at the very beginning, I would like to uh, invite uh, Victoria to share about um, uh, his uh, her um, experience and also working in Minneapolis uh, and in the uh, visual, um, uh, visual art uh, department of the Walker Art Center and to share about their collection, how their museum collect uh, non-Western art and how they interpret uh, this uh, different kind of art to the uh, audience in uh, US. Uh, may I also briefly introduce the background of uh, Victoria. Victoria is a, 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 a assistant curator of the visual arts at the uh, Rocker Art Center, Minneapolis. Her recent project include the exhibition Sai uh, Amajanit. The uh, following this slide, I, I, I saw the uh, exhibition's brief uh, uh, on the website is very impressive. And also the way things go last year, as well as the very important the sculpture commission for the reopening of the Minneapolis Sculpture Gardens uh, recent year. And previously she worked at the Art and Cultural Institution in New York and also including the uh, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and also the Museum of Modern Art and the Witness Museum of American Art. And Victoria study history in uh, Harvard College and also got a master's degree in the history of art and visual culture from Oxford University as well as an MBA from Harvard Business School. So um, I give the time to Victoria. Thank you. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Thank you so much, Raymond, and uh, thank you, of course, to the symposium organizers for putting together uh, the panels today and tomorrow. Um, as Raymond mentioned, my name is Victoria Sung, and I'm Assistant Curator of Visual Arts at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis. Um, and I'm really delighted to be partaking in this panel with all the other panelists. Um, so we've all been asked to uh, put together brief um, introductory presentations on the topic of this afternoon's panel, which is uh, how are Western museums collecting and understanding contemporary art from Asia? Um, and as I was uh, preparing um, the presentation, I realized that the question, although seemingly straightforward, is very complex. Um, and it really deserves kind of a very nuanced, thoughtful um, response. And so I say that up front because I don't think my few slides will um, do it justice, but I hope we can have a really wonderful conversation after all the presentations. Um, and so to begin with, you know, the question itself begs uh, many other questions. Um, this was mentioned, of course, in, in the opening um, presentation as well. Um, you know, what exactly do we mean by Western museums and what do we mean by um, contemporary art from Asia? Um, and I'm sure that um, myself and all of the other panelists probably have, you know, different responses um, to that question. Um, but what I thought I would do in uh, this brief introduction is give uh, an overview first of the Walker's collections. Um, so the Walker Art Center has about 11,000 objects in its permanent collection. Um, and it includes works by some 2,200 artists. Um, and our focus is art made um, from 1960 onwards. Um, so of course, 11,000 objects is um, 
quite modest compared to other institutions of a similar size. Um, but we like to say that our collections are really rich and unique, um, and uh, the right word might be eclectic, um, in that we don't necessarily collect uh, representative works um, by each artist, um, but we actually like to collect artists' um, practices in depth and kind of follow them over the years um, and really follow the way that they're working uh, today. Um, so I thought what I would do to start off is actually talk about um, a couple of our um, exhibitions that we've put together over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And the reason why I'm talking about our exhibitions program um, is really because our exhibitions program and our acquisition strategy go hand in hand. and They often really feed one another. Um, we say at the Walker that we sometimes maybe even walk, uh, work backwards um, in that we tend to do extensive research um, on an artist's practice. Um, we you know, cultivate really long, meaningful relationships with that artist and plan exhibitions together, do publications, and then we may acquire a work. Um, so we do that because the acquisition is really kind of the culmination of that relationship with the artist. Um, so I'll start here uh, with an exhibition that we just opened in September, and it's one that um, I'm very close to. As uh, Raymond mentioned, uh, it's an exhibition that I just uh, curated called Sia Armajani Follow This Line. Um, it's an exhibition that was co-curated uh, with the Walker Art Center and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, and it's open in Min uh, Minneapolis until the end of this year, and then it, it goes on to New York. Um, Sia Armajani is an artist uh, who we actually uh, collected his work starting in 1962. Um, so that was the first, we were the first institution actually to acquire Armajani's work. Um, and since that time, we've amassed a collection um, of over uh, 35 works. So we have the largest institutional collection um, worldwide. And so uh, since 62, you know, it's been about uh, if my math is correct, about 56 years or so that we've really cultivated this relationship. And the exhibition, this 60-year retrospective of the artist's career, um, really represents, um, again, the, the culmination of the relationship over those five decades. And so I have just a couple um, installation shots here. Um, the exhibition uh, spans um, Armajani's entire practice, starting uh, with works um, that he made when he was still in Tehran in the late 1950s. Um, and then it goes uh, through works from, let's say, the late 60s and early 70s when he um, was engaging with conceptual art, um, when he arrived in the United States. Um, and then it goes to very recent production. So the most recent work in the exhibition is from 2017. Um, and those are works where he's actually returned to using Farsi script um, in creating these really um, beautiful uh, large scale drawings of urban topographies. Um, the other exhibition I'll mention here is another recent one that we did in 2016 with Taipei-based artist Lee Kitt. Um, and so uh, I mentioned this exhibition as kind of a, a counterpoint to the C.R. Majani exhibition um, because Lee Kitt is an artist who we've actually just started really developing a relationship with. Um, and so the way that this exhibition actually uh, developed, um, I'll show here uh, one of Kit's works that's in uh, the Walker's collection. Um, this is uh, I Can't Stop Falling in Love from 2012. And our former director, um, Olga Vizo, had actually seen this work in Kit's show in Shanghai. Um, and then she brought the work into the Walker's collection with the intention of um, making a show together. Um, so this is kind of a, a different a different way of working where we've you know work with uh, younger emerging artists on solo projects. Um, but one thing that I found interesting because I, I just saw Kit a few days ago in Shanghai and he was saying that um, this was a very meaningful show for him. It was his first um, US solo uh, presentation. And it was very meaningful because he said many um, Western museums will collect contemporary art from Asia. Um, but they will, you know, purchase the work and then put it in their collections and may show it in group shows or collection shows. Um, and he said for him, the Walker really stood out because it has this history of really putting on solo presentations or solo projects um, with artists um, in addition to acquiring works for the collection. Um, and that really shows kind of a commitment um, on the part of the institution in really championing um, practices uh, from this region. Um, so I, I know I don't have a, a huge amount of time, so I'll flip through quickly. Um, uh, there are a few other examples. Um, 
And so I just wanted to mention a few other exhibitions um, where we also presented kind of the first um, US retrospectives or uh, solo ex exhibitions with artists. Um, this is the Huang Young Ping retrospective that we did in 2005. Um, I have the Tetsumi Kudo exhibition here uh, from 2009. Um, and then we also did solo presentations uh, with Hegu Young in 2009 um, and with Minuk Lim in 2012. Um, and again, all of these represented kind of the first US platforms for these artists. Um, and I hope in uh, kind of giving you a brief run through uh, very quickly of um, the Walker's exhibition program that you can kind of see how our exhibitions program and acquisition strategy um, dovetail with one another. Thank you. Thank you when we see uh, Lee Kee's work in Walker Art Center. And I'd like to get back to Hong Kong because um, I remember that Lee Kee and other uh, local young artists have been so in a very important uh, alternative art space in Hong Kong, the parasite. And take this opportunity. Today we have Alan here. Alan, um, may I introduce a little bit about Alan's background? and. And uh, Alan now um, contributed actively to art development in Hong Kong and also in the international art platform. He's on the board of the uh, uh, Empress Museum and also the co-chair of the Parasite. Um, uh, this is the uh, pioneering and longer standard uh, non-profit making uh, alternative, alternative art space in Hong Kong. He is also the co-chair of the uh, Asia Pacific Acquisition Committee of the Tate Museum. And also with his general generosity, he has also supported the um, Pompidou Center, uh, Mori Art Museum and other uh, uh, cultural and art institutions. And I would like to um, ask with um, Alan's your very rich experience in working as the board member of many uh, international uh, institutions and I would like to know as a board member or uh, the member inside board, how they support their museum to collect some of the non-Western artwork and uh, what is the, the, the target or what does they think about if as a, a board or a board member to support the curator to make such a uh, decision to collect something non-Western uh, art? Um. Well, first, uh, thank, thanks for having me and very humble to be a man, real art expert. Uh, my day job is very far away from art, but I do like art. Um, I, I'm involved on in a couple of museum boards and I do have a point of view, uh, which may not always be correct, but I'm ha very happy to share that today. Um, on, on, on why institution in the West collect Asian art, I think, um, at least for the more ambitious institution, I think it's unthinkable that they don't really include Asian art in in, in the overall presentation of what's happening around the world. Um, I, I think Boon mentioned earlier that, you know, how could you leave out works from, you know, from regions where two thirds of the population actually reside. Um, so, so I think, but, but of course, you know, the way that at least very personally, I see um, Western institution present uh, Asian arts are very different. And I think again, you've mentioned that um, uh, early on, which is at least with Tate, which I'm, I'm involved, um, they, they really see themselves as um, to, to the museum to tell a global story. And of course, when they tell a global story, Asia art, we have to be a part of it. Um, and, and so therefore what happened is, you know, you would see, you know, artists that are acquired through the, the, the Asian committee are put side by side to um, artwork from the West. So for example, we've recently acquired Liu Jianhua's work and, and also um, uh, Liu Fan, and th those are put uh, basically side by side to uh, other minimal, m minimalism work uh, from, from artists from the West. So, so I think you know, the way to take, for example, we think about it is, is very much they're trying to tell a global story. Whereas I think more often, and maybe Walker is a little bit different, but you know, certainly if I think about what, what we've seen recently at the Guggenheim, for example, it tends to be a bit more of you know, Asia as a region, right? So maybe that's more of telling the difference um, of you know, how, whether it's Asia more broadly or Southeast Asia, had, had a slightly different uh, perspective or, or, or um, di different 
ideas on on what contemporary art is. So so I think you know institution in the West do take different views, but but I think all of them, at least the more, again the more ambitious one, would think it is unthinkable to not not to include it. Um, the, the the collecting process is something that uh, I think a lot of these institutions have started quite a number of years ago. For example, Tate has started its first uh, international committee uh, more than a decade ago. It started with, well, it's international for the Tate, but it started with the North America Acquisition Committee, and then the second was South America, and then the third one is Asia. So even Asia was set up more than 10 years ago. And I, th I think it was set up because maybe, I, I think what you're alluding to a, a little bit as well, which is, um, at that point, collecting Asian art doesn't quite fit into either the the, the, the practice or the budget of, of the main museum activity. So therefore, by creating this international um, acquisition committees, they can find uh, additional support patrons and also dedicated curators that look into the region. So that's certainly how Tate has gone from uh, a couple of committees more than 10 years ago now, I think there are nine committees um, covering pretty much every part of the world. Um, so, so I think I, 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 in addition to this maybe not fitting into the main uh, museum collecting activity, you know, the, the, the idea of additional funding re really is an important one. Um, what we discuss a lot in, in, in the committee is um, you know, first of all, is what, uh, again, I think it goes back to the, um, how, how the museum see its, its own collection. So for example, the Tate certainly is trying to tell a global story. So when it was looking for works from Asia, it is trying to find that similarity. Um, so, so again, a, a lot of the work f may, so I think, you know, something that you want to talk about later on as well, which is it may not be the most obvious choice, but it's certainly something that fits very much into Tate's collection, right? So that's how they think about building a global collection where Asia was part of it. Um, what, what I find quite interesting in the, in the last couple of years is there's actually a lot more, there isn't any discussion on, yeah, do we need to collect more Asian art? Because I think that we're, we're way beyond that point, but a lot more question on what is, uh, who are Asian artists? And I think you, you've mentioned that briefly. So. Um, for example, Jan Vo, who's having a show right now at M Plus, is he an Asian artist? He's barely lived in Asia, right? Um, uh, discussion around uh, uh, Martin Wong, you know, he's Asian American. Um, uh, Byron Kim, similar, right? So, are, are these? Does this go into the Asia Committee, or someone should pick it up? Or if we don't pick it up, pick it up, would it be left? Um, Basically, basically ignored by 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 bas the by the different uh, collection committees. So, so I think we, there's, there's at least from from what I can see, there are renewed and I think important discussion on what are Asian artists and what should go into our collection. And I, I think certainly from from Tate's point of view, we we tend to lean forward and say, let's let's be a little bit more embrace uh, um, embrace it and, and and make sure that we we don't leave. Um, and I think you've mentioned an Indian American artist earlier. Let, let's make sure they don't get left behind, and, and let, let's make sure that they are represented properly on an international platform. It's quite clear that um, as the West Western Museum, when they choose the uh, Asian artists uh, for their collection, they will have a certain kind of the. Uh, consideration may maybe not just about the uh, curatorial decisions only. Maybe, uh, for example, like the global story. I think it should be a very interesting topic that uh, maybe um, we could uh, further uh, discuss later. And this time, um, I would like to turn to the um, another side of the earth. Um, today we have a. Uh, Sarah here, I would like to turn to the Middle East and Western Asia, uh, 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 the contemporary art about uh, uh, the contemporary art um, environment and uh, the uh, development on um, this part. Sarah is an uh, award winner, a uh, curator and writer on global art and was the winner of the table, Art Table New uh, Leadership Award for Women in the arts in um, 2016, she was the um, Guggenheim US, UBSMAP 
curator for the Middle East and North America, and also have uh, um, and also uh, curate an exhibition. Um, but a storm is boring from Paradise um, at the Guggenheim Museum in uh, 2016, and also this uh, exhibition travel to Milan in um, uh, last year. Uh, this year, yeah. Okay, um, Sarah has cur uh, has also curated uh, many uh, uh, exhibitions and also um, organized many projects for several international um, uh, biennale and also festival, include some in a, 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 for example like the um, uh, Tashkent uh, biennale in uh, Ubiskan uh, um, and also the art uh, festival in other. By Zhang in uh, 2015, so many, so many Middle East Asia countries that we are not familiar familiar with. So I would like to have the, this chance to have your uh, talking about this part and share about how the art development or especially the contemporary art development in this uh, regions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Ressa. I'm currently an independent curator, but most recently I was a Guggenheim UBS map curator for the Middle East and North Africa. I'd just like to firstly uh, thank everybody for being here. Also, Fabio Rossi and the entire Hong Kong AGA uh, committee and members and to my fellow panelists for being here this afternoon. As uh, Raymond mentioned, several countries that I am looking at, they are also part of Asia. The Middle East in particular, it's dual continental. It runs through Africa, North Africa, as well as West Asia. So my work has taken me between two continents. In addition to that, also focusing on the diaspora. And um, it's very interesting. We're discussing collecting practices this afternoon in relationship to Western museums and particularly my work. I was brought into the Guggenheim for three and a half years to diversify their collection as part of the Guggenheim UBS Map Global Art Initiative, which was sponsored by UBS, the Swiss bank. And it entailed bringing in three curators from three diverse regions, one from South, Southeast Asia, June Yap, who actually initiated her project here at the Asia Society in Hong Kong after it traveled from New York. Um, Pablo Leon de la Barra, a Mexico City-based curator who studied in England, and um, he was charged with Latin America and myself, the third and final phase, Middle East and North Africa. And the slides that you see here are from the exhibition when it was first enacted at the Guggenheim. So it was a twofold project. Firstly, it was a collection building exercise to enhance the Guggenheim's collection. And secondly, it was also a curatorial um, endeavor that allowed for an exhibition and also for curatorial scholarship with the intention of a touring venue as well. So it would tour on. And in addition to that, it was an opportunity to share knowledge between the Middle East, West Asia and North Africa and our colleagues in the United States. So it was a shared um, opportunity for a cultural and curatorial uh, exchange of knowledge building. So that was really key here. What was most interesting for me was to create a transcultural, transnational project with the Guggenheim, one that implicated the Guggenheim quite uh, from the beginning of the story. So as I was collecting, I was thinking about the history of the Guggenheim and um, thinking particularly about the collecting practices or the ethos of the museum, which is three tiered. Uh, all the acquisitions from the time of Peggy Guggenheim and uh, Solomon Guggenheim to our current day were based on three principles. One was art of our time, second was non-objective painting, and the third was art of abstraction. So that was really kind of defined. And the Guggenheim tends to position itself as a global museum. However, like most Western American, North American institutions, it's European facing. So the Guggenheim is a very particular European facing institution. And that was very interesting. However, its history is kind of very broad. And in terms of what I was trying to do, is not only to bring in artists who reside within the diaspora, both within the United States and Europe, but also those living and working in the region. And many of them held multiple studios. You know, they were living and working in, in the Middle East, but also in Berlin, in Paris, in London, and in New York. So that was interesting to kind of think about that. And it was important for me to raise the opinion of something called empire, that there's a reason why these artists live and work in Europe. There's a reason why they're Western educated, that they're working there, because the question kept on coming up is that why are they living and working in, in Western cities? However, there's a history there. 
So that was something that I had to educate my colleagues on at the Guggenheim. But it was also something very interesting if we open up wider discourses around other modernities and other modernisms, which is something that I'm very much invested in within my own art historical research beyond the Guggenheim. So it was a way for, um, it was a double-edged critique, really. It was a way to, for me to bring in works into the collection, but also to think about the Guggenheim's actual history, because my role entailed building a collection and handing it over to the Western curators and leaving at the end of it. So it was a set three and a half year term that would then conclude once the project had finished. So I would then hand it over and then these works would then be, you know, entering the wider collection based on the premise that I identified earlier on. And one of the ones that I was really focusing on out of the collecting principles was art of our time. That was really key for me to kind of think about a contemporary collection, but also think about how it marries well with the larger collection at hand. I mean, I was given a lot of free hand there, which was very fortunate for me, but also I was very much interested in the history of the museum. Frank Lloyd Wright is the architect of the Guggenheim and one particular work, if you could kindly go to the second slide, please. I know that maybe I could, oh, sorry, beg your pardon, here, uh, was very important for me to kind of reflect upon the Guggenheim's history. It was one of the protagonists as I was collecting and bringing works into the institution was to think about Frank Lloyd Wright and he's the architect of the Solomon R. Guggenheim. What we see here are two works. I will focus on Ala Yunus's work called Plan for Greater Baghdad, which, are, which is the architectural project that you see at the bottom. We see a series of works on paper, but also there are architectural models that reside uh, also within the frame of this image. And this particular project was a plan taken from actual project that Frank Lloyd Wright was part of in Baghdad in the 1950s under the uh, then moderate Hashmi monarchy. Frank Lloyd Wright, along with another group of Western architects, including Le Cavuzet, but also um, Martin Gropius, were all invited as part of the modernization of Baghdad. And it is important to point out that many of these cities within the region that were going through their own period of modernity were very much Western facing, but also secular societies that looked at the idea of healthy body, healthy mind, healthy city. And you see that in a lot of Bauhaus cities in the Middle East as well. But in particular, in reference to Baghdad, this plan for Greater Baghdad was an original project by Frank Lloyd Wright that was never ever realized. It was a plan to initiate uh, a cultural complex, a university on the outskirts of Baghdad. However, the monarchy collapsed and so did the plans. The several years had passed and later Le Cabuzet comes and tries to do something with these plans he's unable to. And then there is an Iraqi architect called Rifat Chadri who was imprisoned. And when Saddam Hussein comes into power, he learns about this project. He releases Rifat Chadri from prison and he says, look at these plans. He was familiar with them having initiated them and worked on them with Frank Lloyd Wright. And he realized what would later became the um, Saddam Hussein Gymnasium in Iraq. So it was very interesting history there, cross circulating history that I really wanted to bring into the Guggenheim. What was really interesting for me is at the time Frank Lloyd Wright, his plans were abandoned. He didn't know what to do with them in the 50s when the monarchy had collapsed. Many of those ideas were then enacted in the Guggenheim. So they are, exist in the Guggenheim's building. However, ironically, none of the Guggenheim curators were aware of that. I actually had studied Frank Lloyd Wright for my undergraduate degree when I was actually visiting uh, the United States at Columbia University as part of an exchange and working with Hilary Ballon, who is an expert on Frank Lloyd Wright, that there was already this transcultural history at play there, which is something that I want to discuss today a little bit, because I know, Boone, you mentioned it, we we're thinking about other modernities or modernism within the plural sense, that it should not alienate. Or we think about cities such as Chandraga in India, which Le Cabuzet is part of it, actually resides in India. So Baghdad being another example. I mean, there are other Bauhaus cities in the region as well, Cairo, Tel Aviv, I could, to name a few. But coming back to this one, it was really interesting because the Guggenheim is implicated in that. Many of these uh, patterns and shapes that were left because Frank Lloyd Wright didn't know what to do with them are in the Guggenheim's building. They run across the facade of the building. You can see them internally where the towers meet the new townhouse, meet, excuse me, meets the rotunda of the museum. The townhouse uh, towers came a little later, a few decades ago, but the building was still enacting. Uh, so it was really interesting for me to kind of think about that in terms of collecting practices, in terms of museum history, and to kind of bode that within the architecture to cement that. So there was already this transcultural idea there. 
And uh, many of the other works were also part of the sort of wider scheme of looking at the role of, the, of Western Asia and North Africa, but also thinking about that, coming back to this transcultural sort of idea of transnational histories. And that was really key in terms of what I was trying to achieve. And I think that what is unique about the Guggenheim's collecting strategy was that ability that it acknowledged its lack of knowledge on the global. It definitely, you know, made strides. You know, we do have an Asian art curator, Alexander Monroe, who was formerly the director of the Japan Society in New York, who has been instrumental in focusing on Asia. With my particular role, it allowed for me to look at the other Asia. It allowed to look at uh, the other part of Asia that is not necessarily considered, like, for example, countries like uh, Iran, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Iraq. They are all part of Asia, but they are not considered part of the dominant Asia that we think about when we discuss the discourses of Asia. So that was a really interesting idea for me, because being Asian, but being from Central Asia and the Middle East by ethnicity myself, I'm often thinking about East, looking at East, and that's a really key part of my own curatorial practice, how one East examines the other East, which is why I accepted Fabio's kind invitation to be here, to be part of this uh, wonderful symposium here this afternoon, to, to try to unpack some of these ideas, because, you know, during the idea of, if we think about the Silk Road, you know, it implicates all of these countries, but it also goes to North Africa, it also goes to Europe, it connects back to Europe through Venice, which was the great city. And that is always part of this uh, sort of uh, thinking that I'm trying to bring to not only curatorial practice, but also to this uh, acquisition building exercise at the Guggenheim. And of course, it was, uh, you know, met with a little bit of, um, you know, uh, a sort of resistance, because I didn't want to label it as a Middle Eastern or Western Asian contemporary art exhibition. It was an exhibition that was ideas driven narrative. That was the kind of focus here. And it was one of the first exhibitions that of diasporic art and all, all art of the Middle East that didn't define itself based on geographical remit. It looked at ideas, it looked at uh, ideas around architectural ideologies. It explored the idea of conceptual uh, contraband. It looked at smuggling. It was very, very vast in its curatorial and sort of thematic identity. And that was something I just wanted to bring. I know that we're very short of time just to quickly uh, sort of bring full circle is that acquisition building shouldn't just be geographically specific. It should be rooted within an ideas driven narrative. And when I when I used to prepare an acquisitions text for the Guggenheim, not just for the map, but later for the general collection, I would compare an artist's practice to two works in the Guggenheim's collection and also compare that with two works that I wasn't even presenting by the artist over in general. So we were looking at five pieces altogether. So there was already that wider relationship, but also inwardly looking, looking at the artist practice as well. So I'd just like to conclude on that. I know we're short of time, but thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for giving us a new horizon on the contemporary art that happened in the different uh, regions in Asia. And last, I would like to get back to Hong Kong, and may I introduce Catherine, Catherine from the Kwai uh, Fung Hin Art uh, Gallery, and she's now also the uh, currently the member of the board of the uh, directors uh, of the Association's um, um, Cultural France Hong Kong, and mainly for the uh, La French May every year, and members of the board uh, of the governor of the City University of Hong Kong Foundations, and also member of the advisory committee on the art development of the uh, Home Affairs Bureau. And Kevin, I know that you have always support and um, promote Asian artists through a career workshop of all that uh, uh, merge together the spirit of uh, Oriental tradition um, with Western uh, ideology or idea um, and introduce them to museum and collectors who are interested in contemporary Asian art. And would you like to share with us about your experience in reaching up the artist and also the museum or maybe the collector? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you first to the uh, Gary Association, the two chair lady, Adriana and then the Angela, Rosie and then uh, William, all of you have made such effort, you know, to make the symposium happen. So thank you to invite me to be one of the panelists. I hate to tell you my age. This is my 27 years, you know, as a gatherer. So Rosie, when I look at you, you're so young, you know, compared to my history. 
So uh, I think I'm like most of the gallery for the first 15 years, you know, I'm so excited, so passionate to bring in so many exhibitions from France, from Spain, from Italy. And then I have been presenting the Chinese art in I think nearly 20 international art fairs, you know, and which now I don't do much. So I want to tell you two incidents in my career that really uh, changed, you know, my direction in the 2007. If you know the artist name called Lin Fong Man, which is the master you know, of the 20th century, so uh, I love his work since childhood. And my father collect a little bit. But I always, you know, I mean, I read the book, I find it in fact, you know, he's nice, he's a form, you know, composition is inspired by the Modigliani. So in 2000, I visit uh, Paris. I made appointment with the Modigliani Institute. And then I visit them, I went to their archive, and get to know the director, Mr. Parasol. So uh, that is the first, you know, incident really inspired me. At their archive, you know, I spent days, you know, three days and nights, like a child, to look at all the uh, information they have. Motigiani, as you know, he passed away at the age 36. And even, you know, after he passed away for the 10 to 20 years, he's not famous. So then what makes him to be famous? So in fact, as the daughter, you know, and that is pretty poor, start the foundation, and then, you know, to uh, build this archive. And they employ a 27 years old, you know, a student from the art history, you know, and then to build this archive. Can I tell you, he spent 35 years, you know, to research and get all the material of all the previous painting. I think either he gave away to exchange for a piece of bread or, you know, to sell a very cheap. So then the, in the 1975, if I look in the archive, you know, when they bring the first exhibition in Spain, you know, Madrid Museum, nearly 100,000, uh, uh, nearly half a million people came to see the exhibition. I'm from there, you know, so people get to know who is, you know, the Modigliani. So that is the first incident, you know, I'm so inspired. And the since then, you know, we're still the good friend, you know, with Mr. Pariso. And I think he's like my teacher. And in 2003, I was uh, very honored that he invited me to be the curator. He said, Catherine, since you study so well about the Modigliani, so why don't you bring, you know, this exhibition, you know, to Hong Kong? And then, but since there's no money, I cannot find much sponsor. So we bring a collection, small collection of 36, you know, drawings, the original drawing, plus about 10 sculpture, you know, to the Hong Kong University Museum for exhibition. So that's the first incident. So what happened, you know, to the second incident I'm talking, which inspired me a lot. I don't, uh, I don't know how many uh, of you, you know, are in Hong Kong in the RC in the 2007. So before that, you know, I'm like, a, you know, any gallerist, you know, China is very popular. So I think from 2001, I mean, 2000, you know, up to the 2006, we bring in so many Chinese contemporary artists. But in 2007, I think I don't know what, I get lost. You know why? The prices of the Chinese contemporary art at that time is increasing dramatically. All the artists like, uh, you get to know them 10 years ago, maybe it's 10,000 US dollar, you can get it. But 2007, anybody you go to, they're talking about half a million. 1 million, 20 millions, I think I get lost. I don't think I can even find collector to buy it, you know? Because if you look at the option houses, you know, all this big four is hitting for the 14 million, 15 million, which I'm not an investor. So I don't know how I can tell my client, you know, what is the real value of, you know, those price. So in 2007, when I have nothing to do, I went to Paris, I visited my friends, you know, the Zawuki, which I get to know in 2000. And can I tell you in 2007, I mean, in the last five years, I get to know him uh, in set. It's very quiet, it's very old, not many exhibition. And then he stopped, you know, creation basically. So there's no Gary presenting his work because there's no, no much new work. So every time I went there, we talk about his life. And the only one thing he said, he feels so sorry because he only had one, I mean, he has many books, you know, catalog about individual exhibition. But he, he only had one book about the 20 years monographic 
in his life. And after that, no, pub uh, no publishing company is interested to publish any book about his life long. And then he said, before I die, I wish I can have a book about my life. At least 74 years retrospective about my development, you know, about my arts. So I think we are good friends. I just say, oh, I do it for you. That's it, you know. So not because of any reason. Uh, I'm not his gallery to represent him at that time. He stopped producing, but as a fan, as a good friend, I'm also a fan for him, you know. I love his work. So I think I spent nearly three years, you know, 12 times, you know, in Paris, you know, living with him for 10, each time 10 days, you know, to work together with, you know, his assistant Yen and his wife. So can I tell you, I have to think about this period. That really opened my eyesight. So during that three years, it's not only say to work with the book, you know, to, uh, to look at every year, every pieces, what he create, to look at all the document, all the exhibition, that you understand his art. But you know what happened? Because during that three years, there's so many people. Like for example, I'm so impressed. One time I'm working, you know, together with Yen. Yen said, today, I have no time for you. I said, Yen, why are you busy? He said, because, you know, Montreal, you know, the Quebec Museum came and then they want to do an exhibition, you know, Zhao Ki and then uh, Paul Kri. Then I said, why Paul Kri? He said, you know, they're a good friend. And then he's influenced by him, you know, a certain period when he arrived in Paris. So now they're interested to do, you know, the uh, retrospective, you know, exhibition for a uh, not retrospective, 10 years, you know, work, you know, the, during the time they know each other. So, I mean, that way we're talking about Paul Kree and then Zhao Ki. What impressed me is because with the archive, with the Yen, with the, uh, somebody is expert, so he flick, flick, flick. So I see how he replied, you know, to the curator, you know. Oh, because, okay, for the last, that, that period from the 63 to the uh, 70, I mean, that period, you know, we have about this work, and this work is available, you know, for uh, exhibition. 30% is from my, you know, collection for the family collection, but 70% is uh, in the collector's hand or at the museum of a, of a university or museum. So you know what this foundation do? Because they really want to support the exhibition. So at the end, Yen wrote to the Asia collector, wrote to the museum and said, we have this, uh, we have a request, you know, we have exhibition like this, you know. So would you like to borrow the work or will you do something, you know? So that's how I learned, you know, what a museum exhibition is a form that, you know, need a lot of support, you know, from the archive. So, uh, I mean, that three years for me is like a degree course, you know. I mean, even I don't get any degree. I feel I get it. So then from that time, you know, I'm thinking how I should help the Asia artists. Because bear, uh, bear in mind, when we talk about the Asia artists, I think, you know, especially like uh, the now, uh, the, the current one, if they're still alive, they're already 70, 80, some even pass away. But think about the time, it's not like today. The young artists have so much support, and that's the most difficult time in China, and even, you know, in Hong Kong, the art scene is not so prosperous, but now they're getting old. So, and at that time, there's no digital, there's no money, so a lot of old work, you know, is amazing. A lot of uh, the document is not there. So, uh, then I uh, go back to this one, the second book. I learned from the Zhao Qi Foundation. So I represent this artist, Li Hua Yi. I think he's uh, 71 years old. He left Shanghai in the, when he was uh, 34. And then he lived in San Francisco up to now. So uh, he was ink painter. And then, uh, so uh, like what you say, as old artists like him, I think he's very anxious to create a new work. And then he never have time to uh, really to organize, you know, his previous, you know, the portfolio, what he paying, what he had done. So finally, you know, we spent another three years to make a monographic book, you know, with, you know, his work. And then now we're doing, coming up, you know, is uh, the uh, catalog resume for him from the early period up to now. So, uh, and this book, you know, now we are very happy because we get the support from Marie Soli. We do the uh, editorial, they do the publication because my small gallery, we don't have a distribution, you know, of the book. We can only sell at the gallery. So, uh, but this is in the language of English, Chinese complicated and Chinese sim uh, simplified. 
Okay. Then you ask me, so why I can tell you about the Asia art, whether it's a pop, I mean the museum collector, because it seems I represent this artist. If you look at his, you know, uh, CV, there is a lot of a Western museum, I mean American museum collecting his work. But some they collect, like Brooklyn Museum, they collect maybe 10 years ago. But they are thinking, you know, maybe they will organize, you know, a show for him, you know. I mean, because uh, 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 they, you know, they, they didn't have his work for the latest work. So they wrote, you know, to the artist. The artist be sent to me say, you know better than me now, because you have the archive, you know all of my work. So now we get a lot of a museum coming, either, you know, like I say, they might not say directly say they buy, because it is because they already have their own, you know, First, they have their stated mission of their collection. So either they want to add, you know, a few more pieces, you know, for the reason work. Second, you know, they want to create an exhibition, then they see whether they can have it to borrow. Thirdly, I think I was approached now, you know, by some of the, uh, uh, the patron. I mean, maybe the museum directors say we need to collect more about this artist's work. So they wrote to us whether certain period, further year, the work, is available in Asia. So I think last three years, you know, I think I get many inquiry from museum about acquisition. So that's later we can share. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And I think um, this time for us to further discuss some of the uh, question related to um, our topics. Um, Museum have long been the center of um, uh, knowledge making center, and through their uh, collections, exhibitions, and also research, museum always uh, create some new uh, idea, new knowledge. What I would like to know: What role had Western museum play in defining defining contemporary art from Asia? Maybe I think maybe more. Bohui, can can you, uh, Bohui, Bohui, can you can you share with us about how how Western Museum define uh, contemporary um, art from Asia? And I I would also like I would also like want to know how they give Western uh, audience a new understanding in contemporary art that happened in Asia. <laughs> Big like, question. I think there's like 20 PhDs in that, <laughs> that question. I, I think the point also of this panel is that there is no one kind of approach. So we, which is like, that's the answer and the problem as well. I mean, you, and part of the reason, like I mentioned uh, in my presentation, has to do with how the museum in Europe and America historically is constituted. So hence, you know, where the modern and contemporary department sits vis-a-vis -vis the regional department, the Asian department, and whether, for example, in the contemporary department, there is sometimes whether there is like in, in Art Gallery of New South Wales, you know, where does photography sit? Who collects photography from Asia? Does photography department collect? Does contemporary art department collect? Because they are, even if they're the same department, there's different curatorial clusters, you know. So I think that complicates the kind of uh, discussion simply because, for example, uh, if you go to New York, a co the Kohenawa work, the deer, that sits in the Asian gallery, when you see it, of course, what you read off from it is very different from, let's say, if it was to sit in the Met Breuer, you know, the context of that. So I think these sort of complicate the, the issue. Um, I think what's more important is for curators and exhibition makers to be aware of the context, the differing context, but also the historical legacy that have shaped the context. I, I think what I was struck by what Alan said about the Tate, this globally relevant collection and finding similarities, because of course what it immediately reminds me of is of course the conceptual father of that is uh, something like the magicians of the earth, when you have this kind that you could build a collection where I could take a work from Egypt and put it next to a work 
from Japan at some point, uh, which is what, for example, many Western curators and galleries are doing with uh, the Gutai and the Korean, the Dan Sekwa. Uh, and and uh, if you want to know, I would say, you know, those of you who go and if you look at the actual history of the Dan Sekwa, it's rather different from what it, it's not really about. Uh, history is not about abstract art. But if you look at the positioning, but that is a kind of Western positioning that now if we want to understand this work in the context of the West with our collection, with our narrative, we, we, it's not that we, it's wrong, it's that I think it's one perspective. So I think we just have to be aware of which perspective we are adopting. So what is contemporary? I can tell you, you're never going to answer that question, but as long as you're aware, like, is uh, work using artisanal traditions, uh, which are very marked, as particularly in Southeast Asia. You know what what part of that is contemporary, and what part of that is something else that you don't call contemporary. I think it depends on where you're sitting and who you're sitting. I think what's important is to realize that the same narrative told from the perspective of an Asian museum is quite different from that in a Western museum, and even in the West let's be clear, different museums have different legacies and different perspectives. So it's not as if the West is, is also a kind of monolith, you know. Uh, so I think that's the best we can do. It's not a very satisfactory answer. but um, May I add to what Boom was saying? I think it's really important to understand that Many cities in Asia are still going through their industrialization. This already happened in the Victorian era in England, for example, in Europe, and it, it's completed its process. But if you think about cities such as Shanghai, Dubai, Istanbul, they're still going through that. So therefore, their museums are also reflective of that. You know, the contemporary art scenes are also reflective. I mean, with the exception of Iran, I mean, Iran had a contemporary art scene as going back as far as 67, you know, even before we even identify what postmodern was, yes? Even prior to that with the Shiraz festivals, even before they even had a museum, they were inviting international Western artists there. So there's a really interesting uh, dynamic there, but we must consider this, this idea of industrialization because it's really key to understanding you know, how modernity, I mean, there isn't that clear trajectory how we identify in the West when you study history of art, you know that 79, everything that comes after that is postmodern, everything before that was modern. And um, we don't have that same pathway, you know, it's very different because of industrialization, because these cities are still going through this process, they haven't got that clear trajectory. And I think that's really key in understanding that. But if we think only in terms of Western museums, I mean, there are so many emerging reflective points here within Asia itself. Like, as I mentioned to you, if we think about Asia as a more fluid term, thinking about Dubai, thinking about Istanbul, I think that's really key. In, in reflecting this conversation. Thank you. Um, I, I think every institution collect and present works for a reason, you know, as we've talked about, certainly for, for, for the Tate, for example, they're trying to tell a global story. So I, I think it's, it's good that they provide a platform where great artists and great works from, from this region are, are shown to as many audiences as possible. But I, I think we, yeah, and, and now I'm speaking as very much someone who lives here and as, as an Asian. I, I don't think we should let Western institution define what is good Asian art. I, I think it's super important for for this region to to build and and for people to support local institution. I think what National Gallery Singapore has really done, in, in my, from my point of view, is I think it's really put a spotlight on on Singapore and Southeast Asia art more broadly and and create and, and find its own voice and narrative. And I'm sure Amplus is going to do that for for Hong Kong and Greater China more broadly. So I think we we it, it, no, it's not a competition, but I but I do think you know it there, there needs to be institution in Asia that 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 would allow us to find our own voice and, and define the, the story and the narrative. Picking up from Sarah's point, uh, the other reason I think why it's very difficult to give an answer to that idea of the contemporary is that 
uh, and it's to got to do with the the recent history, the fact that many cities are still industrializing. Uh, we must also remember that modern and contemporary art, when it appeared in many places of Asia, is in the context. It first appeared in a particular historical context of decolonization and national independence. That is very, very important. What it suggests is that context is very specific in the countries of Asia, because uh, like with the Indian progressives, you know, um, so I, I have an issue with, uh, I will say one example is I have an issue with, with a certain, well, there was an, an exhibition on that, but never mind. Uh, with a certain that says that, you know, the art that is important from Asia is, is things that don't look national because the nation, we are in post nation. I mean, come on anybody who has read history, you only say that if you have absolutely zero knowledge of the history of Asia. In India, hello, millions of people die at the partition and independence. That's what this art is about. You cannot escape that context. So modern art was an act of freedom, of liberation. So I think that kind of thing, one has to be sensitive uh, to that, particularly in post-colonial Asia, in those countries that have emerged from, from a kind of colonial period and national independence came along uh, with it, which is quite different from the West, you know, also because when that art came, national independence had already happened a long time ago, you know. Huh? I remember that uh, Bong Hui uh, had also suggested four uh, propositions um, how to or po four propositions that can be detected in the practice of uh, contemporary art in Southeast Asia and you just mentioned art must have purpose for society that's that's the point and also persistent of um, narrative and storytelling it also related to history and also the social development uh, and also the different uh, historical situations and, and about, about these uh, different countries, and also migrations and and the dynamics uh, dynamics of the identity. Sometimes they mix together. Someone migrate to U.S. and also they move from one country. Especially nowadays, they born in uh, in a, in place and in their original country, and then. Uh, grow up and then work and live in the third country, something like that. And also the, their traditions and use the, of their language. And all these uh, propositions maybe give us a more, can be used as a tools to give us a more uh, clear picture of the what what different country, uh, what will happen in this country and how relate them into their development of the contemporary art. And I think the last question I would like to ask uh, you, uh, for, for the uh, evaluation and the endorsement of the artistic value in a traditional way, they will be endorsed by some museum curator, uh, art historians, and also the uh, critics or collector. But now the recent global booming of the, in the art market has strengthened the marketplace influence on uh, influence in this uh, constitution of not only the monetary value of the artwork, but also the artistic value. The impact of the market factors on the contemporary Asian art is increasingly obviously. And how museums face this challenge or adjust these new trends in the long run? I would like to share with uh, Sarah or Victoria. Sure. Um, well, of course, I think, you know, the art market has a huge impact on um, Western museums, collections, collections worldwide. Um, and especially at the Walker, I can say that, um, you know, due to increased interest, of course, in contemporary art from Asia, it's also very difficult, you know, for museums to, I think, engage in that game because we are priced out. Um, so we've really adapted our collecting strategies um, because we, of course, are still interested in um, collecting art from Asia. And so we adapt strategies, for example, in working with um, emerging artists, uh, some of the exhibitions that I mentioned, we will commission artists to create artworks. And that will be a way for then us to bring the artwork that was made for the Walker into the collection. 
Um, another strategy is that we work very closely um, with donors or gallerists or um, estates, artists, to um, bring gifts of work into the collection. Um, but there are, you know, for example, um, like Tan Sequa, we can't, you know, we can't purchase works from Tan Sequa artists really at this point. So those are works that we have to look for, for gifts or, you know, find creative solutions. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, we're all being very adaptive at this point. Um, but I think the walker, um, as I may have mentioned briefly in my earlier presentation, has always been kind of left of center in its collection. So we always do try to go um, where other institutions have not yet gone. Um, so we were, you know, one of the first institutions, if not the first institution in the United States to acquire um, artists associated with Gutai, um, along with artists associated with Viennese actionism, and that was in the um, early 2000s. And so we're still, you know, looking kind of left of center. Where are other people not looking that we can really, um, you know, have a major role. Just to add to, thank you, just to add to Victoria's point regarding acquisitions and uh, particularly pricing out in terms of auction, I mean, for example, the Abu Dhabi Guggenheim has a much larger budget than what the United States Guggenheim does, you know, so that was another thing where they could directly purchase from an auction. But whereas with the U.S. Museum, because it shares its collection with Bilbao and Venice. It was a different story and gifting is particularly key. Also endowments, sponsorships, like UBS project did afford the Guggenheim a very generous multi-million dollar grant to purchase art from three diverse uh, cultural topographies. So that was interesting. But then again, you know, also developing relationship with artists' estates is also key as well. And how uh, you know, the long-term strategy that you mentioned earlier on, Victoria, is also part of, I would say, reflective of many modern museums museums where they are actively looking at an artist's career. And so that is something in the case of like, for example, the Guggenheim holds, um, you know, several estates also. And uh, that's very important to kind of think about building. And there are relationships with artists that are then continued that we purchase a work, we purchase two works, the artists and gifts, because obviously we want to be able to support a living artist as much as possible as well through monetary gain, you know, so they're able to reinvest that within their studio practice. So there are a number of challenges that need to be considered. But of course, depending on the circumstances, you know, that can shift. You know, because they all, you know, sitting at the acquisition, I'm sitting on the other side, you know. <laughs> so I must say, you know, I mean, like what you say, you know, like the last few years, you know, the inquiry from the museum curating gets more and more, you know, to buy the artist's early work or donation, whatever. Like what you say, you know, M plus is rich, you know, so usually they pay well, but then some of the museum in the state, for example, I just got one case, you know, a Swiss collector donated a big collection of the M painting, you know, to the uh, Los Angeles Museum. But then the, the curator checked everything with research. They need six artists, certain period, to add more vary to the collection. So I think I was referred, you know, to me. So can I tell you what we do at the end? After, you know, working for the three months, you know, I think uh, I'm able to convince some of the Asia collector, you know, to donate, you know, nearly 20%. And then some, they will find the uh, trustee, you know, the museum to buy some. So I think it's always a mix, you know. I mean, a donation, maybe some acquisition. But I think the gatherers now, I think like what we say, if we can do a very uh, good relationship with the others for years, you know, and where we know where the collector is. So usually we do help, you know. So I think the artists at the age now, or the estate, they're not going to, to talk to the collector. They're not going to negotiate. So that's, a, that's the, where the gatherers, you know, can play a role. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the very um, meaningful uh, discussion and sharing today. And um, I think time is up. <laughs> and thank you all. And uh, I would like to also thank you again for the uh, Hong Kong AGA for organizing this uh, symposium. I hope that in the future, we will have some more this opportunity to sharing. And have a very good uh, evening and also a nice weekend. Thank you so much.